really rotate, it's in that vector. That does the first 10 degrees of abduction. And then middle deltoid will do the rest if all you're doing is lifting your arms, then pretty much middle deltoid can do everything. You do abduction, you don't feel anterior deltoid doing much of anything. If you go against resistance, oh, I didn't know it moved. <laughs> I thought it was going to stay still. So if you're going against resistance, then anterior deltoid will help. And posterior deltoid will help. But mostly anterior deltoid, which is right here, is going to work with the clavicular portion of pec major. So this is your delt. Pec major, the clavicular portion is also a flexor. So it's a flexor. The part that is attached to your manubrium and your sternum, which is the most, the major part, the, the sternal portion, that's a horizontal, either a deductor or horizontal flexor. So a horizontal flexion is this, but that's also adduction, so either way of describing it is fine. Horizontal adduction or horizontal flexion. And that's pec major, the sternal part of the muscle. If you're doing bench, you're on the bench and you're doing slides, if you're doing bench press, it's primarily this part of pec major that's doing the work. If you're lifting dumbbells out in front, it's going to be the clavicular portion that's doing the work along with deltoids. Rotator cuff, you have your little sits that I talked to you about. It's your little ana uh, mnemonic. The S's, you have subscapularis and supraspinatus. I is going to be infraspinatus. T is teres minor. Teres minor and infraspinatus together do external rotation. I'm oh, sorry, yes, external rotation. If this is subscapularis, it's going to be an internal rotator. And if that is supraspinatus, it's going to be doing the first 10, de 10 degrees of abduction. So it's your rotator cuff, subscapularis, attaching anteriorly to the humerus, so internal rotation. Infraspinatus teres minor, attaching posteriorly to the humerus, so external rotation. Supraspinatus attaching to the top of the humerus, so abduction. But if you feel the supraspinatus, it really undergoes the most of its contraction in about the first 10 degrees. And after that, it just kind of holds on to its tension and the majority of the work is being done by the deltoid. Biceps brachii has a short head and a long head. The difference is not the length of the muscle fibers, it's the length of the proximal tendon. So the short head goes to the coracoid process of the scapula, the long head has to come over the top of the humerus between the two tubercles and then uh, um, tuberosities and then attach to the superglenoid tubercle on the scapula. So the tendon is a little bit longer for this long head than it is for the short head. Triceps, the long head comes, it's 
proximal attachment is the scapula. The lateral head and the medial head are originating on the back of the humerus. So they're um, going to have a shorter distance to the tendon, the common insertion. So biceps, brachii, the tendon, the long head goes up over the top of the humerus to attach to the scapula. The short head goes directly to the coracoid process, which is a little shorter distance. The biceps tendon is actually better seen, from, its first insertion is better seen when you cut away the superficial muscle. Some of the connective tissue fuses with this fascia here, but that's not its insertion. You look at the way the artist has illustrated it, you can see muscle through that connective tissue. That is implying it's a very thin connective tissue. It's not a ligamentous attachment. This other white piece, that's where the ligament is going to head towards the radius. Brachial radialis crosses the elbow joint and it also acts on the wrist. So it's a flexor of the wrist and it also can participate in resistance in elbow flexion. Better if your hand is halfway between supination and pronation, then its angle of pull is optimum. This muscle here called palmaris longus, its tendon is cut because the tendon is going to insert into fascia in the palm of your hand. All that palmaris longus does is contract that fascia and make a little cup that you can then drink water out of if you're at a spigot. You can drink, make a little cup and drink the water out of the palm of your hand. You don't need palmaris longus, and a lot of people don't have palmaris longus. If you need to make that cup and you don't have palmaris longus, you use your opponents, flex your fingers, and you got a rudimentary little cup there to drink out of, so you don't need palmaris longus. Yes? How come people don't have it? They're just born without it, probably because it's really not that important. <laughs> important muscles are, some people are born without important muscles, but that's really severe muscle disease, but there's, there are healthy people probably in this room who don't have palmaris longus and also don't have the third muscle that makes the triceps sura. Does it have to do anything with the, like, uh, with ethnicity or anything? Or really? Yeah. No. Yeah. No. Probably this happened way before yeah. classes were that important. You're lazy people who have cups to drink out of. They maintain their pinky muscle. I lost their palmaris longus. I don't know. That's a good theory. <laughs> now try and prove it. <laughs> but this little pinky muscle is very important. It's still there. And the indices, the one that goes... So mommy used to go all the time that kept this muscle around that extends their indices. So anyway, what, what is the reason? Um, probably it is a not really not of major importance. And so there are, you know, what you pass down generation to generation is what keeps you surviving. So ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, I think that's what they say. So the traits that you have that make you survive to the point where you can reproduce, those are the traits that are passed on. So in some people, they survive, they didn't have palmaris longus, so they passed it on to their kids, they don't have palmaris longus. So it, it's, it's evident out there that you know, evident enough that when people dissected their cadavers, they found out hmm, there's no palmaris longus here. And there are other muscles that are commonly missing as well. If you want a list, I have a list made up. <laughs> so palmaris longus is one of those. The other muscles here that are in, still important, flexor carpi radialis and flexor carpi ulnaris. Those flex the wrist 
extensor carpi radial, um, extensor carpi ulnaris here, extensor carpi radialis longus and a brevis, um, two muscles that extend the wrist. They form a force couple to allow you to do radial and ulnar deviation. Yeah. Do you notice all, all beauty queens and Queen Elizabeth? That's how they weigh. And probably Henrietta, I think, or whatever, her Marguerite, I don't know, uh, Sweden, whatever. And all queens weigh like that. So obviously those horse couples are very important. If you're going to be born into royalty, you need to be able to live like that. So those muscles are not missing. Also to open doors, open jars, <laughs> close closets, those are important muscles. So we typically all have them. These muscles here, we'll talk about when we get to the muscles of the hand. Triceps. Um, brachii, here you can see the long head attaching to the scapula, and this is your lateral head, and the short head is underneath. Those are going to originate from the humerus. And so, considered extrinsic muscles of the hand and fingers. What that means is the muscles are on your forearm, but they're crossing and acting in the hand. So they're referred to as extrinsic muscles of the hand. For the flexor, we have superficial and deep muscles. So we've got a lot of muscles that work on the hand. <clears throat> the superficial muscle for flexion of the fingers is flexor digitorum, tells you it's flexing the digits, superficial for its shape. To me, it looks like Hokulea's sail, so sail and superficialis, that's how I remembered it. The, what you can actually do is look at the tendons. The superficialis tendon comes down to the middle phalanx and then it's Splits, attaching to the middle phalanx. Underneath it is profundus. So superficial tendons are running on top of profundus tendons. They have to split to allow profundus to go through. And profundus will continue on to the distal phalange. So when the profundus contracts, the distal phalanx bend. When superficialis contracts, then the middle phalan phalanges bend. MCP flexion is due to an uh, intrinsic muscle of the hand. So profundus is underneath superficialis. You see that on this slide. We've got flexors for the thumb, we've got abductors for the thumb, and we've also got opponent's muscles for the thumb. Flexors can be extrinsic, and they also can be intrinsic. And extensors will be extrinsic and not intrinsic. The intrinsic muscles of the hand we have these interosseous muscles. They're on the back of the hand. They're also on the palmar surface, so dorsal and palmar interosseous muscles. We've got those muscles to spread our fingers apart and bring them together. We've actually got an abductor for a baby finger. We've got an abductor for our index finger. But our middle finger and our ring finger they rely on these interosseous muscles to move them from side to side. The, so middle finger going side to side is interosseous, ring finger is side to side interosseous. To bring the fingers back together, the index finger coming back and the, the, 
the baby finger coming back, it's interosseous muscles. So they have adductors of their own, but they need the interosseous to come back. The, if you want to know which contracts for abduction and adduction, come and see me. I'm not going to make you responsible for that in class. So just know that abduction and adduction, baby finger has its own abductor. So abductor digiti minimi. And there is also an abductor for the uh, abductor indices as well. Somewhere it's not, I'm not seeing as labeled. But anyway, that and then the thumb also has its own abductor. Lumbricals seen on the palmar surface of the hand, those will bend the metacarpal phalangeal joint. They come across and attach to the proximal phalanx, and when the muscles contract, then you get metacarpal phalangeal flexion, so MCP flexion. <coughs> Opponent's muscles to do opposition, you'll hear in anthropology classes that what makes humans so special is this opposable thumb. Well, actually, we have opposable thumbs and we have opposable pinkies as well. We have opponent's muscles for the, the little finger and we have an opponent's muscle for the thumb. So we're doubly special because we have two opponent's muscles. We have a opposable pinkies and thumbs. The others don't have the ability to oppose anything. They can flex and then the thumb can come and up into opposition with the index and the ring finger. The, I don't know if you're coordinated enough to oppose your pinky to all the others, but I'm not that coordinated. Never tried to do it that much. Okay, um, okay so lumbricals, MCP flexion, interosseous for AB and abduction of the finger. Thumb, index finger, and baby finger, they have their own abductors, but the thumb has its own adductor. Pinky doesn't, and um, index finger doesn't. So they're relying on the interosseous muscle. Hip, we have the gluteus maximus cut there, gluteus maximus intact here. What you see for its insertion is it's attaching to the posterior surface of the femur, the proximal end. It also, if you look at, come back and look at the superficial muscles, it's also attaching to the iliotibial band. So it's attaching to that fascia that runs down the lateral surface of the leg. So it's got multiple attachments. So posterior femur and then also the iliotibial tract. Underneath, you can see superficially the medius, and then you cut the medius and you see the minimus. The medius and the minimus attach on opposite sides of the greater trochanter. The minimus attaches anteriorly and the medius posteriorly. So the medius is an external rotator. The minimus is an internal rotator. When they contract together, they do abduction. So glute medius is internal rotation, minimus, and sorry, this is external rotation, minimus is internal rotation, and then when they contract together, the rotation is canceled, they are a force couple, and then they do abduction of the hip. <clears throat> These other muscles 
I'll mention piriformis because if you're going to be a physician or you're going to be a trainer or you're going to be a PT, then you're going to run into piriformis problems a lot. Piriformis is in alignment to, to do external rotation and a weak extension of a hip, but most of the time it's there to stabilize your hip joint. And it gets very tight because when we stand still, we need to keep, keep those hips from moving out of alignment. So piriformis works really hard to keep our hips stable, our actual hip joint stable. I'm not talking about the, the pelvic girdle now. I'm talking about the hip joint. So it's attached to the sacrum. It comes out and attaches to the proximal femur, and it stabilizes the femur in the acetabulum. What you don't see here is the sciatic nerve comes out right underneath the piriformis. So when the piriformis gets tight, presses on the sciatic nerve, and then you get numbness and tingling or this burning sensation down your leg, or you might even get muscle weakness and inability to use your leg. Depends on how severely this nerve is compressed. So the treatment is stretch out the piriformis, which isn't easy to do. It takes, uh, takes you a lot of flexibility to even get to the piriformis muscle. You've got to stretch other muscles first and then be able to get those relaxed enough to get to the piriformis. If you see people doing stretches, I don't know if these pants will let me do it. If you see people with their knees up here and they're wrapped around like that and they're twisting like that, that's a piriformis stretch. If you see them lying down, bringing their leg up, and then going over, 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 and letting the leg go down, 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 down. That's a piriformis stretch too. So there's various piriformis stretches. You find somebody who has a real tight piriformis, they can barely even get their, their knee up to their chest, let alone in the position to actually do a piriformis stretch. The other muscles of piriformis, learn that because you're going to be dealing with it in medicine or in physical therapy or in athletic training a lot. The others, be aware of them, but I'm not going to hold you responsible for them. So quadratus, the gemellus, you can forget them for this uh, class. I'm not going to test you on them. Come down to biceps femoris and your... Other hamstrings, you have to know those. So, uh, posterior, we'll do anterior first. Major hip flexors. You have your psoas major, and of course they're the psoas minor, but your folks not pointing it out, it's this little part here. So just know psoas and iliacus. Together, the psoas and the iliacus attach to your lesser trochanter and their hip flexor muscles. They will work with your rectus femoris, which is coming from the iliac bone and becoming part of the quadriceps. That also is a strong hip flexor muscle. The Adductor muscles shown here, you have adductor magnus. Magnus means huge. It's actually going from the proximal femur behind these other two adductors and all the way down to the distal femur. So it is a very broad, large muscle. Adductor brevis, adductor longus, those make up the magnus, brevis, and longus. Those are your true adductors. 
A lot of textbooks will say gracilis is an adductor. But if you lie down and you do adduction and palpate your gracilis, unless you're going against resistance, gracilis isn't doing anything. But if you internally rotate your hip, then gracilis contracts. So it's actually an internal rotator of the hip. Sartorius, that's your tailor's muscle, longest muscle in the body. Tailors in the olden days sat cross-legged on the floor. And so in order to sit cross-legged, you have to use sartorius. You've got to bend the hip, bend the knee, and then externally rotate the hip. That's what sartorius does for you. It starts in the pelvis and crosses the hip so it can flex the hip, crosses the knee so it can flex the knee, and it also has an angle of pull for external rotation. So it bends the hip, bends the knee, externally rotates the hip, then you can cross your legs So do yoga or sit down and do your stitching as the old time tailors did. Pectineus is oftentimes described as a hip flexor. It's not so, so active during just lifting your leg up because you have the iliopsoas and you have the rectus femoris that will do the work for you. But against resistance, then pectineus will become a hip flexor. So it's probably there more for hip stability along with your piriformis. So posterior stability by piriformis and anterior stability by the pectineus. So sartorius, now with all of the muscles there, comes across rectus femoris, across vastus medialis, crosses the knee and attaches anteriorly to the tibia. Tensor fasciolata is putting tension on this iliotibial tract along with gluteus maximus which is attached to it. The, the proximal tension on the iliotibial tract gives you lateral stability for your knee. So it gives you a little bit more reinforcement than just the um, lateral collateral ligament will give you. Vastus lateralis coming from the posterior femur vastus medialis, also coming from the posterior femur, where that linea aspera is on the posterior femur. That's the origin for both vastus muscles. But you can see from the surface, you can see iliacus and psoas will be under here. You can see pectineus, you can see adductor longus, and you can see gracilis. Biceps femoris, you see the long head, you see the short head. Common insertion on the lateral side of the lower leg. The long head is best seen up here, originating from your ischial tuberosity. That's where your long head is coming from. It's going to go down the back of the leg and join the, the short head, the biceps femur short head, which originates on the back of the femur. And then they'll both insert across the knee. The other hamstrings are your semitendinosus, and then medial is semimembranosus. So that's, I use the M for membranosus and the M for medial to remember which of the hamstrings was most medial. That was my cheat sheet, kind of. Uh, ten, actually, when you see in the cadaver and take the muscles apart, semimembranosus has a lot of membrane, looks like gristle of meat, and semitendinosus has a really long, round tendon. 
and that's what they were named for. Collectively called, yes. You know what? Why are you telling the name I was just going to get there. <laughs> so when you are a farmer and you are curing ham, you cut off the thigh of the pig and you use those tendons. You use the tendons for the biceps and the semimembranosus and tendinosus. They tie them in a knot and they hook them on the hook in the smokehouse and smoke their ham. So these were the, the strings of the ham, the tendons of the ham, so hamstring muscles. The strings are the tendon, and these are the hamstring muscles. And that's what you eat at Thanksgiving and Christmas, is pig hamstrings, but also the pig quadriceps and adductors and all that too. <laughs> Okay, so lower leg, the nice, well-developed calf will have a heart shape in the back. So they have an indentation up here, and then kind of get broad and narrow down again. So kind of a heart shape. Two heads of the gastrocnemius, which is your superficial heart-shaped muscle. Up here you can see a third little muscle called the plantaris. Take off the gastroc and you see more of plantaris. You also see the soleus muscle. Soleus is named for the, I believe, the fish that Phileas soul comes from. It's a flat fish. This muscle is relatively flat, kind of oval shape. This is attached to your calcaneal tendon. Plantaris inserts on your calcaneal tendon, and so do gastroc. Medial and, long hit, um, medial and lateral hips. So those form a tricep. They're in the back of the leg, so they're called triceps sura. That's why we have to call this triceps brachii, because we do have another triceps in the leg. A lot of people are born without plantaris. So this is another muscle that really doesn't do much. You have gastroc that can flex the knees and flex the ankle, you got soleus that acts solely on the ankle, you've got your popliteus muscles up here, and you've got your hamstring muscles up here that will flex the knee. So you really don't need plantaris. The only time you will ever miss plantaris is if you run into a bandsaw and you have your tendons in your hand and you need tendon replacement, I and mean, people have that happen. So construction workers, sometimes they sever the finger. They need tendon replacements. You can harvest the plantaris tendon, which is nice and long, and then use it. You can cut it up and replace tendons for the fingers. So if you're born without a plantaris, you're out of luck for tendon replacements. So that's the only time you would ever, ever miss plantaris if you need a tendon replacement. Underneath plantaris is posterior tibialis. It's a very important muscle because it, along with tibialis anterior, does inversion of your foot. So it has a common insertion. Follow the tendon of tibialis posterior, comes around medially, and then underneath the, the arch of your foot and so does tibialis anterior. One approaches from the front of the malleolus, one approaches from the back of the malleolus. So they use the malleolus as a pivot point to do the inversion. All your fibularis muscles on the side, and then your flexors of your big toe also from the back. Popliteus muscle seen here, it helps to lock your knees if you have to stand at attention and if you can surreptitiously, surreptitiously unlock your knees while you're standing at attention, nobody sees you, then you can contract your muscles in your lower leg and you will be less likely to pass out and faint on the parade field. When you're standing at attention with your knees locked, then blood cools in your feet, 
doesn't go to your head, then you don't get oxygen to your brain and people pass out. They pass out quite often when they're standing at attention. So plantera, I'm sorry, popliteus blocks your knees, but it also unlocks your knees. Anterior tibialis, this muscle is very important when you're walking because in order to not trip on your toes, anterior tibialis has to pick up the toes so you can swing through to heel strike again. People are jogging and come down on their heel and spend too much time with their toes up. They don't relax the tibialis anterior and go down and run and, and go through the uh, finishing the strike. Then the tibialis is held, is holding the toes up too long, then tibialis anterior gets pulled off the tibia. And guess what you have? Shin splints. Yes. So it actually physically gets pulled off the front of the tibia. So if you have really nice calves, you you see the guys they they'll pose with their knee flex and their ankle flex so that they maximize the gastroc and the soleus. And if they're really well developed, you'll actually see a little bit of tibialis posterior down there. So that's what I always check out. If, if a guy's posing on stage and he's doing his calves, well, he just walks out on stage. Girls too, but I don't prefer guys. <laughs> anyway, they walk out. Right away you can tell. Have they trained their calves or not? They can be huge up here. They have scrawny calves. They're not going to win. If they have good developed calves and they do the pose correctly, and you can see gastroc soleus and tibialis posterior, you know they did some serious calf work. And it's like, yeah, thumbs up. Huh? Have you been a judge? No! <laughs> I watch it on TV. I'm a, I'm a TV judge. <laughs> actually, I used to train a guy who was... Actually, I trained two guys who were going to try and be bodybuilders. One guy I, I ended up not training because he would do these stupid, stupid supplement stuff. And I warned him, he's like 19, he's a beautiful guy with all this muscle, all this potential. I said, you know, you, you could destroy, you could kill yourself doing this, so no matter. If I have my car, I'll be happy when I go. But, oh my God, I don't want to be associated with that guy. But that's, that's their attitude, a lot of these guys. They don't care what they have to do, what kinds of steroids and natural products they have to take. As long as they win their card, which means they're a professional bodybuilder, then that's, that's their goal. They, if he got it and he got it 21, he would be happy. And so, how can you deal with a person like that? That is, don't want to be part of that. The other guy was a little bit more sensible, but not quite the potential. So probably that's why he was more realistic about how to do it. Uh, anyways, no, I don't judge. I judge, but I'm not a judge. <laughs> I am a judge. I do judge quite a bit. <laughs> okay, I used to compare my cats to some guys, but yeah, wimp. <laughs> my cats are pretty bad now, so I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that. Anyways, um, so shin splints. This is the attachment for your tibialis anterior. If you are, it's mostly, it doesn't occur in serious runners who really have long strides and, and are running fast. It has, happens more in joggers who have more of the vertical type. In. Their progression is up and down, up and down. And so they spend a little bit longer on their heel than they should. And they need to see a coach, they have to work on that, and then usually them, they can correct the tendency to develop shin splints. Okay, the, the foot is pretty much like the hand. You've got extrinsic muscles that flex and extend the toes. And then you've got intrinsic muscles that do that as well. So extensors of the toe, we have extensor digitorum longus, and we have special extensors for the big toe. And then 
you have lumbar pulls, so you can actually AB duct and AD duct and flex your toes as well. So lumbar pulls will bend your toes forward, and then you have interosseous that will, will spread your toes apart and bring them back together. So your toes and your hands pretty much work uh, similarly, have sim similar muscles. So here are your lumbar pulls, and then you have plantar interossei, and then you will also have dorsal interossei muscles. All these muscles that cross longitudinally, they keep your longitudinal arch and also will help to control the transverse arch. So if those muscles get weak or these tendons get lax, then you get flat foots. Okay, fascia, muscle layers, compartments. This is really important if you're going to be treating people as a medical doctor, ER doctor. You might see people with compartment syndromes coming in. And you have to diagnose this because if you allow the inflammation that's in the compartment to persist, you don't locate it and treat it, then muscles may die and then you lose that function. So muscles are layered, we saw muscles are layered on muscles. The muscles will be connected to other muscles by fascia and they will be attached to skin by fascia. They will be anchored to bone by fascia. If you have dense connective tissue anchoring a muscle to bone and then muscle over it anchored to that underlying muscle with dense connective tissue. Dense connective tissue doesn't stretch very much. So if there's swelling, it has no place to go, especially for that muscle that's deepest. It's right against the bone and it doesn't have anywhere to swell. Because it can't swell outwards, can't swell inwards. If there are, and there will be, because that muscle is functioning, the muscle cells will have to have nerve supply, will have to have arterial blood supply, will have lymphatic supply. If the swelling is not controlled, you cut off the blood supply, the muscle dies. You cut off the nerve supply, the muscle ceases to function. It also is running the blood vessels. The blood vessels don't dilate, muscle dies. So you gotta treat that. The deep fascia is limiting any swelling, um, any um, relief of the swelling by expansion outwards. So the important ones, the arm is not so bad because upper extremity, you only have one bone and the muscles are kind of all around the bone and then they all go out to the skin. So the, this lateral head of the triceps probably is the most compromised because it's surrounded by this fascia, but it can still bulge out towards the skin a little bit. So an injury to the tricep is going to not be as, in, as, as big a problem as the, an injury where you're, you have deeper muscles that are next to bones. So the tricep, yeah, it's got some uh, compromised tissue there, but it can still swell out in this direction. But you look at that, you got blood vessels right there. So you don't want to compromise that. Superficial muscles, no problem. Deeper muscles, you want to watch out for. Forearm, the deeper muscles here, those will be more compromised. These deeper muscles, more compromised, but still they have a place for the swelling to go. And they'll be less likely to press on the nerves and arteries and veins that are in the connective tissue. Simplified compartment for the upper extremity, you have one bone, and then these dashes are implying the, the membrane, this fascia. 
So it's essentially in the upper extremity, you have a flexor compartment and an extensor compartment. Posterior of the humerus, it's all extensor. Deltoid, extensor of the shoulder. Triceps, extensor of the elbow. Anterior, you have flexors of the elbow like brachialis, biceps, synergist, flexor of the elbow, brachioradialis, synergist, flexor of the elbow. Those are all in this anterior compartment here. So simplify drawing it. One bone, you don't know if it's the one bone that's the femur or the one bone that's the humerus until you look at the connective tissue. If there's two compartments, the posterior, and I'm not going to be flipping things on you. This will always be posterior, so always be anterior. This is going to be the extensor compartment. That's going to be the flexor compartment. You look at the forearm, you've got two bones. The, the section, the plane of section that they took here, the radius and the ulna are about the same size at that location. If you went more proximally, the ulna would be bigger than the radius. If you went more distally down here, the radius would be bigger than the ulna. But where they took the plane of section and usually where they're talking, referring to the compartments, is in this middle part of the forearm. The bones are about the same. This is going to tell you that this is not the lower leg because the tibia is always bigger than the fibula. It never gets small in one area and big in the other. You have an interosseous membrane. We have that in the leg too. But you have the, inner, the connective tissue going straight out to the side. So for the forearm, you've now got an extensor compartment and a flexor compartment. So interosseous membrane and then the connective tissue separating uh, extensor from a flexor compartment. The picture here tells you what you need to know about the compartments in the, the upper arm. You have, if this muscle back here swells, sorry, the muscle in the forearm, if this mu uh, muscle swells, it can swell out through the skin. This muscle swells, you're going to have a bulge on the ulnar side of your forearm. Swelling can come out that direction. The superficial muscles, swelling on the surface. So there's no muscle that is really compromised in the forearm. And also in the upper extremity, just with that one head of the triceps, maybe a little compromise. Okay, take a break and then we'll talk about the lower limb compartments.